We recently released a nice video about how it's productive to look at problems, and how transphobes never take productive approaches to anything when hating trans people is an option. But if there's anything I love more than pointing out how transphobes are bad at everything, besides getting stoned, hanging with my friends, playing video games, spending quality time with my loved ones, hugging my cats, and otherwise having a life, it's flexing my biology knowledge on the people who think us transes don't understand biology. I mean, these are the people who claim the word woman is 60 million years old. For reference, scientists estimate that the human species is roughly 200,000 years old. English, recognisable by English speakers a day, is roughly 1200 years old, turning 1201 this May. At least, that's what it put in its birthday registry. Two more punches and it gets another free country to colonise. So, let's take a look at the movie Jurassic Park, quite possibly my favourite personal movie. I first saw it when I was about three years old, and I still keep the McDonald's promotional cups. My dad wondered where they went. As with most science fiction, Jurassic Park tries to make the scientific information in the movies at least feel plausible, even if the tech to do those kinds of things isn't here yet, or might not even ever be. So let's dive in. Mr. DNA In the movies, the means by which the dinosaurs were created was by extracting DNA from mosquitoes preserved in amber. Let's start with that. The part about finding a preserved mosquito isn't implausible. But how many mosquitoes do you think saw a wave of tree sap coming their way and just thought to themselves, Fuck yes! Maple syrup soak! Bring it! For however many there were, the odds of it being permanently preserved is in itself relatively slim. A quick Google search suggested that the first time a preserved mosquito with blood in its digestive tract was found by paleontologists was in 2013. I don't know if there's been a second one. Then there's the question of what did the mosquito feed on? But, even if it had fed on a dinosaur, now we have the question of whether or not it's possible to sequence the DNA. DNA is actually pretty difficult to work with. It's a family of molecules in a long, long chain. A chromosome is a single strand of DNA wrapped on itself again and again and again. It's like a Scooby-Doo, if anyone else remembers those from the summer camps. Yes, that's actually what they are called. Except, to compact neatly into chromosomes, DNA coils up into a Scooby-Doo made out of Scooby-Doo, and the second tier of Scooby-Doo? Level of scooby doo -miness. is itself bunched together into something that is somewhere between a knit scarf and a macrame, and each chromosome is entirely made up of two roughly identical continuous threads. And for humans there are 23 pairs of these absolutely massive molecules, and these are in every somatic cell in the body. Every cell that has a nucleus, with the exception of gametes, has a full copy of your entire DNA sequence plus or minus transcription errors, which when I took biology in college is about one in one million base pairs off in any given sequence. There are four different bases, A, T, G, and C, that act kind of like how zeros and ones work in machine language. Mm, kind of. And if you want to know how complex this code is, there are three billion base pairs in the average human genome. If each base pair were a millimeter of Scooby-Doo cord, then that's 3,000 kilometers. Three megameters, you know, roughly 1,860 miles. In order for a gene to express itself, it needs to unzip with the help of an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Then, the exposed base pairs have to be read by another enzyme called RNA transcriptase, which rides along the section of DNA that needs to be expressed, and as it moves along these base pairs, the complementing base pairs of the genetic code that's being read will temporarily attach and be strung together to form a molecule called RNA specifically mRNA, where the M stands for messenger, because what this particular RNA molecule does is effectively carry a message from the nucleus to the parts of the cells that will in turn turn it into a protein. This is where things get really neat. Every three base pairs correlates to one of a few dozen amino acids. Using a chemical reaction that is similar to how keys fit into tumbler-type blocks, the protein factories of the cell, called ribosomes, will attach the corresponding amino acid for each three base pairs of mRNA that go through it. You know those little zip ties and how they just kind of slide through the fixture end? Imagine if every three notches on the zip tie that went through the little fastener, it would pick out one of several distinct pieces and add it to the end of a string of these building blocks. Seriously, nature is amazing. Once all those amino acids are strung together, the resulting molecule is called protein, assuming it's big enough. Otherwise I don't know, I'm a biologist, not a chemist. But anyway, sometimes the resulting protein is the end goal of that gene such as the DNA that codes for keratin, 
which is what makes up hair, nails, is a major part of skin toughness, and is lots of other things in humans and animals. But sometimes, instead of just turning into a raw material, the DNA will code for a tiny piece of intracellular machinery called an enzyme. Imagine that chain again. Now imagine that the forces acting on the chain links between each other, as they were being connected into a smaller chain, caused it to fold itself as it was being strung out, such that it became a piece of machinery. That is how complex proteins and enzymes are. And remember, nature didn't figure this out in the way that an engineer figures things out. Nature accomplished these devices by throwing spaghetti at walls for billions of years. Just so much goddamn spaghetti! The Cambrian explosion was basically nature doing several rails of cocaine and then going on a spaghetti fest. Every organism, every living cell, every blade of grass is, in a sense, nature performing yet another experiment. If you look at a million plates of spaghetti being thrown at a million walls every second for a year, DNA itself is just one big spaghetti, and every moment innumerable cells and organisms emerge and vanish in a symphony of spaghetti of which we are now a part. It's, it's all spaghetti. It's spaghetti all the way down. I fucking love biology so goddamn much. So, anyway, back to the dinosaurs. You might be thinking to yourself, all of that was a lot of explanation. And you would be correct, but if you're thinking that I don't have a good reason for explaining it, this is so that you know just how complicated DNA is. So that now, when we look back to the mosquito in Case in Amber, and we ask ourselves, could we get dinosaur DNA out of that? We probably couldn't even get mosquito DNA out of that. Any one chromosome of DNA, even if there are no chemicals or radiation trying to break it down, has a half-life of 521 years. That means that after at least 65 million years, which is the time between now and when the dinosaurs ruled the Earth, only one out of every 2 to the power of 124,000 would still be intact. Literally an overflow error on my calculator. The odds of finding any one complete chromosome are virtually non-existent, much less completing a library of all the chromosomes that make up any one organism's DNA sequence. And all of that is assuming that a mosquito stomach would preserve the DNA in whatever blood it drank. Unfortunately, mosquitoes did not evolve to become DNA archives for humans millions of years from when they lived. They evolved to take blood and turn it into large mobile gametes. So, even if the mosquito died and was encased in amber mere seconds after drinking blood from a dinosaur, there are enough enzymes in its stomach that, unless it was also flash frozen or something so as to prevent any further chemical processes, all of the blood cells and all of the DNA will have been bombarded with digestive enzymes from the mosquito. Even if we could recover all of the DNA required to complete a full genome? In Jurassic Park, the DNA recovered is depicted as fragmented and full of holes. So just imagine if you printed out the source code for Windows 10 on like a jillion pieces of printer paper with no page numbering, and the stack was thrown into a fan. And as an added bonus, maybe the mosquito also snacked on different dinosaurs. So some of the code is actually for Windows 8.1. So, given that we have found a grand total, to my knowledge at least, of one amber-preserved mosquito that had dinosaur blood inside of it, I think it's only realistic to assume that we will never be able to reconstruct the DNA of dinosaurs. But if we did, could we bring back the dinosaurs? If we lampshade the single most statistically improbable detail of this story, or suppose there's some alternative means to acquire dinosaur DNA, even then that question isn't so simple. Creating an organism from an existing set of genetic material is called cloning, and it is possible, but complicated. The normal start to a multicellular organism is when enough sperm cells meet a compatible egg cell that they erode the chemical barrier. One of them fuses with it, and the egg cell undergoes a chain reaction to lock out all but that one sperm cell. Together, the egg and sperm will have enough genetic material for one individual to be born. Jurassic Park frames DNA as the blueprint for making a living thing, but it's actually more complex than that. A blueprint is usually depicted as a static diagram that shows the end result, and may or may not provide assembly instructions. But DNA is instructions with no pictures, not just for assembling, but also for using. Remember that metaphor because it's very important throughout this video. I mention this now because the egg itself might actually be the most realistic part of Jurassic Park's dinosaur generation, but I'm not sure on that. So you know those boxes your IKEA furniture comes in? We all have the common trauma of those heavy-ass boxes full of boards and wooden dowels, and after several hours of anguish and weeping, 
you have a mediocre desk or bookshelf. Zygotes are basically like that, save for the crying because zygotes don't have feelings. At the molecular and cellular level, once an egg is fertilised, it's now an IKEA box, and the DNA is its instructions. But correct instructions for a desk won't help you if you have the parts for a bookshelf. Similarly, DNA isn't, here's the end result, make it so, so much as a complex system of, do this thing in this order, or, when this happens, consult these instructions. The latter example is the purview of a field called epigenetics, which is too complex for this video. But for now, it's enough to know that it's possible to give an egg different instructions than what it originally had. But as for how effective it is, that's its own can of worms. An egg, like the kind laid by birds and reptiles, is supposed to contain enough nutrients for the zygote to get to whatever stage of growth the creature needs to be at to survive when it hatches. And here's the really weird part, you don't actually even need the shells for anything other than protection and support. But with or without the box, even if you have all of the contents for a dresser, if you try to make a bookcase you might come up short in some parts, perhaps even some critical parts. And perhaps, if you have the right instructions, you might be able to improvise, cut a long board in half to make two smaller boards, but if you are handed the supplies to make a sofa and asked to make a refrigerator, you're going to have a bad time. This is where we take a quick detour to Jurassic Park 3, arguably the worst of the Jurassic World movies. Like, seriously, the kids show was more well written. But there's a very important scene that shows raptors being grown in tanks that act as artificial wombs. The main difference between a womb and an egg is that a womb is vascularized, connected to a living thing that can run around and go get refills. An egg, however, only has the nutrients it was given when it was laid, it cannot go and get more nutrients for an occupant, and usually spends all its time being a really good ally. That's why mammals are a bit more likely for cloning to be viable. Jurassic Park uses ostrich eggs. You take out the ostrich embryo, and either throw it out, or eat it probably, and put the dinosaur embryo on the yolk. Then tape up the hole in the egg you made with a syringe. Or get one of those grape surgery machines, I don't know. And then, presuming that the ostrich egg has all of the fuel and nutrients the embryo needs to develop, you put it in the incubator, like this one, and wait until it comes out. And then... Ah. In all seriousness, while it's plausible that if you are able to construct an egg, artificially or otherwise, or gestate the embryo in a similar animal, as scientists have considered doing with mammoth embryos into modern elephants, oh, that's probably how we got Snuffleupagus. Huh. Even that has its own problems. Even if we get the dinosaur to hatch, or the extinct mammal to burst free from the sacred passage, if we clone it from just any somatic cell's DNA just by itself, it's gonna age young at best. This is because of a thing called aging, where the body of an organism stops working over time. But why would this apply to a clone? It turns out the likely culprit for what we experience as degenerative aging is DNA, or specifically a lack thereof. Every time your somatic cells divide, the entire genome is copied, and one copy goes into each half when the cell splits. This is called mitosis, and your cells are continually doing it. The only problem is, with each division, a tiny bit is lost. At the end of each DNA strand is a section called telomeres, which functions similar to the endy bits of your shoelaces. Those are called aglets, by the way. The shoelace ends, not the telomeres, those are called telomeres. But every single time a cell divides, each copy of DNA has shorter and shorter telomeres, until this clipping starts cutting into important code. You see, DNA isn't just important for creating an organism. It's not just a blueprint. It's work instructions, it's emergency protocols, it's instructions, infrastructure, setup and maintenance instructions, and normal operating procedure. And cells do not have consciousness. That's an emergent property of 86 billion cells, not the possession of any one. So if the DNA instruction for an important protein just ups and fucks off, the cell cannot make that protein anymore. Imagine if each day that you restarted your computer, your hard drive deleted a few bits from the end of itself. It might start with a buffer, but eventually you're going to start losing critical files for drivers. Things will start crashing as the values being referenced stop making any sense, and finally you shave off System32, and it's time to get a new computer. But here's why that's relevant to cloning. When you take a somatic cell, extract its DNA, you bring with it all of the shortening of those aglets. I mean, telomeres. 
So if the length of your telomeres is basically a burning candle, and when you get to the end you die, you are copying an already shortened wick and putting it in a fresh new candle. Which is an even better metaphor than I thought, because it's plausible that some of the earlier genetic data to be lost is DNA that's only really relevant during embryonic development. In which case the cloning attempt would already be fruitless before we even got a mouth swap. Side note, some people have proposed a preventative solution to degenerative aging in humans. Just add more telomeres. There's going to be challenges beyond that to achieve indefinite lifespan for humans, such as a vascular tissue which does not regenerate, ever, but that's another video. This also might work for cloning, I mean just add more telomeres to the embryo before you put in the egg or the hydroponics bay or whatever. They said, as if it's as easy as gluing a clip onto the end of a shoelace. Or we could try meiosis. That's the other kind of cell division, the kind that makes gametes. Normally there's pairs of stem cells in the testes and they take turns splitting into a pair of gametes and then getting repopulated by the other. And we have no idea what the fuck happens in ovaries because that might only be observable in our lab with a very good microscope and very good timing. So, while that's how nature does it, probably not useful for cloning even if we don't have a questionable sample. I mean, if you have access to the DNA of the cells that make gametes, then odds are you can just have the animals fuck. But I will confess, Benjamin Buttonosaurus is probably not your Benjamin Button eats backwards, not early. If the geriatric juvenilosaurus issue is resolved, then there are still obstacles to making Jurassic Park happen. But alas, this video is already looking to be 30 minutes, so we are breaking it up. A quick overview of what we've covered so far. DNA is complicated and there's a lot of it. Amber-preserved mosquitoes would not actually retain usable or even salvageable dino DNA, and even so there's only been like one found so far and it had malaria. DNA isn't just an end picture, it's an instruction set and to be useful it has to give instructions that make sense, and it needs the materials that those instructions call for. If you could get a copy of dino DNA, you might be able to put that DNA into an exile. If that works, you might be able to put that embryo into a similar egg from a non-extinct animal today, and it might hatch. Alternatively, you could put it in the gestational equivalent of a hydroponics bay, and if you gave it all the right nutrients at the right time, it's plausible. If you clone a creature with DNA from most of its somatic cells, there's a high probability that the clone will have a shortened lifespan. This hypothesis is based on the evidence that aging is likely caused by shortening of DNA from the ends moving in each time a cell copies itself. Please do let us know if you found this break from diving into transphobia like we normally do to be a fun experience, or if it caught the interest of someone who hasn't looked into transphobia yet, and if this turned out to maybe get you interested in some of our other work on this channel. If you like this video, please give a like, chomp the bell, and expect a part 2, perhaps even part 3. But we'll stop at three. Three is a dignified place to stop. Two might even be reasonable, if, for example, the first turns out to be seen by many as a classic, and the second a thrilling homage that gives us the adrenaline we craved while being graceful to the innovation of the original that... <sighs> yes, this is a subtweet. Hi, my name is Xylon. I'm a non-binary by Panasaurus and the latest addition to the Critfax Mythos. I'm an amateur photographer and aspiring author, and you can usually find my nerdy self all over the internet, trying to work out what the hell is going on and generally making a nuisance of myself. I would personally like to thank Lauren Ipsum. Oh, wait! We didn't even get to the lysine contingency! <laughs>